Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features Frank Miller's Daredevil number 176, cover dated November 1981. The cover is entirely by Frank Miller here. He's doing pencils and inks. And it is an interesting triangular composition here with Kariji uh, going after Elektra and Elektra coming after Daredevil himself. Interesting use of the lightning effect in the background. That's something that uh, Frank Miller favored in his designs and artwork. And also the way that the rain is cut in with white media into the black background. So a very well designed cover as one would expect from Frank Miller at this point and indeed uh, removing the running daredevil from the corner box as well in order to accommodate the art. One last thing I'll mention is that he is inking himself here with a brush. So there's interesting hatching effects here on Kariji's robe as well. Nice work. Let's open this one up to the first page. I really love the opening three pages of this issue. Picks up in terms of Kariji's story from the end of the last issue where Elektra dealt with him by shoving his own sword right through his stomach and out his back and he shows up here uh, somewhere on New York City's Lower East Side. So this is a, um, a really good five panel sequence of this homeless person um, checking the bin there, the trash can as Americans would call it, maybe for food and he sees the hilt of the blade sticking up from some rubbish. He goes to investigate, pulls it out there in silhouette, and then he's grabbed uh, around the jaw by this massive hand. And then the implication is that Kariji just breaks his neck there. So what an opening, and what an image as well, with the dawn sunrise uh, framing Kariji's head there. And I love this effect too of Miller's, this, de this design effect of his, where he'll draw in buildings in the background, you see the water tower there as well, and leave it to the colorist, in this case, Glynis Wine or Oliver, to uh, fill in the shape with color rather than to black it in. And here we have it in black, but hatching out at the end and then the colorist coming in with the color. And I think that that's something that Todd McFarlane would have studied and uh, learned how to do that from Miller in particular. So the title of this story is Hunters and the creative team is Frank Miller on story and art, Jansen, Klaus Jansen on finished art, uh, Glenn Swine colors and Joe Rosen on letters. So let's continue two more pages in this opening sequence with Kariji. That's a fantastic panel there of him standing up with the blade still sticking out his back and uh, the blood red sun rising at dawn. And so he walks past this hospital. Um, I, th I really like this panel too, this top down angle, this bird's eye view of Kariji and it conveys almost his disorientation as he stumbles up against the lamppost. The police officer there uh, catches sight of him of course with that big blade sticking out of his back, goes to grab him by the shoulder and Kariji just Again, it looks like he breaks his neck, just the sheer power of his punch there and really conveyed in the art too. So he stumbles towards um, an abandoned church and we also get the name, the technical name of his samurai sword, uh, Shiratachi. So the reader in this era learning all about uh, Japanese, like medieval feudal times, Japanese culture and in particular samurai culture and weaponry so we get him in um, silhouette here entering walking up the steps and entering into uh, the abandoned church breaking in through that wooden door conveying just how much strength he has even though you know he's got that uh, sword sticking right through him that's a really nice image there of the nave of the church all the architectural details uh, just uh, left in there in uh, white line and colored in obviously by Glenn Oliver he makes his way up to the altar area and pulls the blade from out of his stomach. Uh, excellent uh, layout here and choice by Miller to leave this panel without borders. Really well done. And then in the narrative captions and Miller keeps the narrative captions concise just to convey only the information the reader who maybe hasn't read the previous issue might need to catch them up. There isn't um, a florid uh, superfluous playing with words in any of these captions it's just the bare information so here in these captions they're worth reading the masters of death know secret ways of staying its icy touch hidden in his blood-soaked robe 
are life-giving substances that he will apply to his wounds. He will meditate, he will heal, and though the city is strange and loud and mighty, he will find Electra and she will die because he's out to avenge the death of his Jonan, his master, whom Electra killed um, in the previous issue. So now we pick up with the hero of the book, Matt Murdock, Daredevil, and he's sitting out on a ledge outside his brownstone apartment. It's a windy, stormy night. Heather Glenn there, his girlfriend, is coming out of the bedroom. Interesting use of a screen tone here by Klaus Janssen on the finished art. And Matt is feeling sorry for himself. And he explains to Heather, I'm blind, more blind than I've ever been. That bomb that hit me a few days ago, it robbed me of my radar sense. It's gone. That was two issues previous. So Heather begs him to come in from the cold and to get off the ledge. But he says, and this is really interesting. He says, there's an old man, my teacher, my mentor, who taught me how to live with my blindness before my radar fully developed. An old man named Stick. And this is Miller developing something new in the history and backstory of Daredevil. We never, we never knew to this point that he had a trainer, that he had a mentor, that he had a sensei. So Heather here begs him, there's no chance. You having a prayer out there. But Matt jumps off the ledge onto, bounces off the lamppost and just almost misses the ledge on the next building. And Heather sees it. He almost died, she thinks. And then we get um, Miller kind of drawing on the old uh, film noir uh, uh, characterizations of women and Heather there thinking about, well, what about herself? But ultimately she concludes here that uh, Matt Murdock is the only man for her and she's got to help him. And we see one of Matt's former flames who has the uh, brownstone under surveillance. It's Electra. So she's crouched atop the ledge of another building and sees Heather emerging with her um, umbrella that she's about to um, unfold there. That's a nice little detail, I like that. And then in the background, this is a trick of Miller's that he's been developing over the previous issues, is we have a top-down angle on Electra and we see uh, Heather there exiting the building and then Miller turns the angle around and now we've got a worm's eye view up to Corrigian silhouette on top of this chimney stack and he's uh, watching and following Electra as she swings away and he's waiting for his opportunity to kill her. He will follow her. When the opportunity arises, he will do what he must. So great storytelling there by Miller as you would expect. And now we've got this uh, scene where Daredevil's out trying to get the location of his old mentor stick so he heads to Josie's bar a grimy saloon just out off South Street and who's there except for Turk and Grotto and Turk is uh, trying to cheat at poker but um, he's such a dope <laughs> he puts out he lays out two ace of spades so that's curtains for him nearly except for Daredevil's there at the bar and he trips him up and he uh, basically says to Turk that he wants information on an old man stick so Turk knows him, Stick. What do you want that old weasel for? Just tell me where he is, but somebody clocks Daredevil with the butt of a gun and he's uh, knocked down on the ground there, almost completely knocked out, he's dazed. Interesting the use of the cartooning effects there, the bubbles uh, by Miller to convey uh, that Daredevil is dazed. That's interesting uh, comics language. And um, so Turk decides that he will uh, kill Daredevil now that he has him at an advantage and this is a great little scene here uh, the panel break here is interesting too where Josie pulls um, a shotgun on him points it at the side of his head and says uh uh Turk not in my joint so they take Daredevil they carry him out to um, an alley beside Josie's bar which is down at the docks there you can see that delineated in the background the rain is falling Klaus Janssen is cutting in white media into the blacks there. And uh, Daredevil comes too. Grotto's warning uh, Turk, you know, like we've never had any luck trying to take Daredevil out before. And he's right. Daredevil comes too, starts fighting back. We've got that classic full horizontal length panel layout by Miller there. The storytelling is smooth and fluid as Daredevil catches Turk in one of these trash cans 
and he scales the wall here and he thinks, he doesn't have his radar sense, so he thinks, lucky me, the sound of the rain hitting objects around me is a poor substitute for radar, but it worked this time. So uh, Grotto helps Turk out of the trash can and Turk's got an idea. He's humiliated. He's got rotten banana skin on his head, everything. He said, something's wrong with DD. Stimmy never should have been able to sneak, sneak up on him like that. That was back in the bar. So we're going to do us some hero hunting. So Turk's got another one of his schemes. They never work out. We'll see how this one goes for him in the course of the issue. And then somewhere close by, a Bowery pool hall. So we've got these tough guys playing pool. It's a different bar. Um, well, it's not a bar, it's a pool hall. And Heather Glenn shows up and she's looking for Stick. So this guy, Snuff is his name, well, you know, it's an evocative name. He uh, basically, when she shows him the money, says, okay. He says, I'll, I think I can help you right this way. So the other guys in the pool hall know that uh, Snuff's up to no good. And so Heather here says, this is just a back alley. So the guy says, but it's as good a place as any to get friendly. But Heather isn't naive and she's brought a handgun with her and she pulls the pistol on him. And so he basically says, sure, lady, sure. Just be careful with that thing, okay? Um, she orders him to take her to stick. Then the scene switches to the Long Island uh, headquarters of the Cord conglomerate. A conglomerate that's featured in the series before. And we've got this janitor cleaning up. They've got like these automated, um, what would you call them, uh, waste bins. And then up out of the waste bin. That's funny. That's a funny joke. Like Turk was... Uh, had uh, Daredevil throw the trash can over him and now he's emerging from another waste bin and uh, Grotto with him too and basically he is saying to the janitor there's going to be no trouble you're going to show me one of them suits I heard about from an electronics fence I know he says they're supposed to make you real strong strong enough to clobber Daredevil so that's Turk's plan now that he knows that something's up with Daredevil that he can be snuck up on, <clears throat> that he's weakened a little bit. Now this is an interesting page here, interesting panel of Daredevil with the smokestacks there, uh, swirling around him, the smoke swirling around him. Jansen is using some screen tones there uh, to delineate the smoke of those wisps as well, and an interesting worm's eye view of Daredevil. But something else as well that I'm noticing in this issue, in particular on this panel, is that Miller has is simplifying the art now. He is getting right, he's getting so confident with his drawing ability that he is able to use less lines and uh, limb out or sketch out just exactly those um, anatomical and clothing lines that he wants. So you can see that here in particular in this panel. We've got a very simplified version of um, Elektra uh, skewering these two guys who were about to take out Daredevil, whose radar sense didn't warm and warn him that one of them had pulled a gun on him. So she's keeping an eye on Daredevil, keeping him safe, but who's following her except for, of course, Kariji. So let's continue with the story. Now, this is a really, I always remember this uh, two-page spread. This is excellent from Miller. Miller's got a good sense of humor. And he works it in here with this guy, Wall-Eyed Pike. So Pike is the guy who knows Stick's location. And he's here in his uh, crummy apartment uh, bed set. And he's uh, brushing his teeth there. So great uh, kind of panel to panel storytelling from Miller of something that's just really quotidian. Uh, a guy brushing his teeth, but he makes it look interesting and hits all the right moments in the four panel sequence as well. So he's there thinking about how uh, Stick hustled him a pool and um, uh, got him for uh, how many bills? Two, two bills, so two fifties. And then in through his window smashes Electra, and she says to him, all business, you're wall-eyed pike. You shall tell me, and you see the wall eyes there as well. You shall tell me where to find the one called Stick. And he responds as she puts the sigh right under his nose, I'm telling you nothing. And then he changes his mind. He says, Duke's Pool Hall, 9th Avenue south of Houston, basement. You can't miss it. So here he's uh, lighting up a cigarette for himself to calm his nerves. And he says, prancing long underwear types, got no respect for privacy. Wonder what she wants with stick. Didn't think nobody was interested in that piece of sludge. Maybe he conned her out of some books too. Maybe she'll kill him. Wouldn't that be 
too bad, just too bad. But then he hears this noise. And that's in, interesting too there. Uh, Jansen delineating the smoke from his cigarette with uh, scream tone. Nice work. So in through the wall comes Turk in one of those cybernetic suits. So he tells Pike that he's looking for a stick. And Pike's response is comically says, you punch right through my wall and you wrecked my bed <laughs> as well. Um, so Turk grabs him by the head, says, shut up. Tell him the location. So he says he's at Duke's. No address necessary. So then he starts uh, reaching for the, uh, the aspirin. I'm too sensitive for this kind of life, he says, as he uh, pops a couple of aspirins into his glass of water, uh, glugs it down. Next of all, Daredevil smashes in his skylight. Brilliant. Stick. Stick, says Pike in response. Dukes. And Daredevil's out the window. <laughs> Brilliant. That sinks it, he says. So he packs his uh, suitcase swiftly. He's heading out of the apartment in his underwear. Jersey. That's where, I'm, that's where I'll go. Got a cousin in Jersey. I can hustle him for enough dough. And then he finds himself looking down the barrel of a gun. And he just sits down in the middle of his wrecked apartment. Dukes. Jukes and the two just look at each other. Jukes. That's hilarious. That's really well done by Miller. Great comic storytelling from him. Comical storytelling, that is to say. Really good stuff. And then Jukes. I even like the uh, the repetition of uh, the the name of the place um, and showing up here again uh, as the scene switches. That's nice. That's nice transition going on there. Playing with the words. Uh, from Miller. So here finally we got our first view of Stick. First time we see him and he's playing pool, he's hustling. Uh, these uh, criminal types sinks all the balls, there's $50 per ball um, and the lads there think that uh, he's cheating them, that he's conning them. So they're getting ready to take him out, he's just uh, choking the end of his cue and in arrives Heather. Heather gets there first somehow and she says, I've been looking for this man all night won't let you hurt him and then daredevil pops in um, a window as well and stick recognizes his voice and here we get a classic frank miller full horizontal six panel layout of a fight scene so daredevil goes charging in up against those lads with uh, their various weapons a knife there a gun there remember he's operating here without his radar sense but he manages to deal with them and Stick here is basically, um, he's basically, what would I say, like dry about the whole situation. He says, I could have cooled off those goons. You're just as stupid as you ever were. So then he whacks him with his uh, pool cue. And he says, you're still a show off punk. Still thinky with your fists. And Daredevil retorts, teacher, I need your help. You bet you need my help, but then what's up with the wall? And that's great storytelling as well. We see the plaster cracking in the wall. Who could this be? Well, it's gotta be Turk, right? So here he is in a cybernetic suit. This is his latest scheme to get the better of Daredevil. Interesting choice here from Miller, the non-bordered panels, the open border panels here, two of them with Turk uh, trying to get uh, land a punch on Daredevil failing abjectly and Daredevil basically says I could have this is hilarious I could have my legs in traction and both my arms tied behind my back and you'd still be too slow to tag me sweet dreams and he punches Turk out that's per Turk dealt with in basically uh, four panel <coughs> excuse me four panels and then oh yeah and I will comment also again it, this page in particular you can see Miller, his delineation of the anatomy of Turk there, of uh, Daredevil, uh, minimalist. So he's refining his style in, um, in some of these pages here, in my opinion. And I don't think it's just about uh, the deadline pressure he's under putting out a monthly book. I think it is something that he is developing deliberately as part of his art style, <clears throat> as he's becoming more confident uh, with his drawings. And then this is another trope of Miller's where he'll you know, pull out of a scene and then there's something happening in parallel, which is that, of course, Elektra has been keeping an eye on Daredevil. And here in the foreground, we have the edge of Karigi's blade. I really like that as well. And that's something that Todd McFarlane definitely learned from uh, Miller 
this uh, way of conveying depth um, in uh, the art, having something in the foreground, uh, like the blade here. Definitely something he learned from uh, Miller. Now, another classic Frank Miller layout on this uh, fight page, the horizontal panels, two of them here, borderless, and just really smooth fight choreography uh, by Miller. And um, I really like just little details, like for example, the way with just a few lines, the muscles and tendons on Kariji's forearm there are delineated and rendered so well. And every, every action here in these two panels is at the maximum um, of uh, physical uh, strain and output. Just really well done <clears throat> using the shuriken there, Electra using her surroundings, the box crate, and now this bottom panel, I really like the coloring here from Glenis Wine as well, conveying the blue of the night. And again, that effect are down by the docks. <clears throat> and you've got that effect where Miller's delineating um, a pier there and having uh, the, the colorist um, uh, um, uh, kind of like indicate it uh, rather than filling it out with, um, you know, like uh, more uh, line details. And now, yeah, so we're really hurtling towards the end of this issue. And just notice, words are gone. There's no more words. We just have sound effects and we're just following the action via the art. So we've got a top-down angle here um, of Kariji entering this warehouse, Electra climbing aboard uh, this truck, basically revving it, the lights go on, she smashes Kariji, Kariji off the pier here, and then the engine of the truck blows up as well. Just really great action sequence there. And now she climbs up onto the, uh, onto the pier. Kariji's blade there is sticking out of the wood. She's slightly injured from the blast. She looks up and here a hand on the dock and Kariji pulls himself up and he's on fire. How do you stop this guy? Just tremendous, these two pages. Now we're on to the last page, final page. So what's she gonna do? So she grabs his sword again and just lops his head off. God or demon, Kariji had a neck that was human enough. So there's his head over there and there's the rest of his body over there. But what of Electra? How long can she survive in the same world with Daredevil? He's witnessed her crimes against his laws and he will not rest until she's been punished. Will she be strong enough when the time comes? Will she be able to kill the only man she's ever loved? She shudders, touched by something colder than the wind. So Kariji's been taken care of, but um, things have not been solved between Daredevil and Elektra, and that's ongoing. Interesting little um, detail here from the letters page. So we've got um, a few letters there, but no answers except for this, this one letter, uh, which asks the question, what does an inker do? And why does Frank's stuff look better when Klaus inks it than when anybody else does? So the answer here is interesting. It's an inker's job to go over the penciler's drawings with India ink, that's a permanent ink, that doesn't fade, thereby making the art dark enough for reproduction. This is not as simple as it may sound. Pencil line is gray not black, and a proper translation to ink requires the work of a second craftsman, who, if he's as good as Klaus is, must be an artist in his own right. Frank and Klaus are very much partners in the art on Daredevil. So there you go. I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Daredevil 176. If you did, please like the video on YouTube, and if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.